then sir there is another problem which is with reference to the cooperative societies as far as the cooperative societies are concerned i can realize the anxiety of the honorable minister that if cooperative societies are employing less than 50 people and if they are not employing power it is desirable that this obligation should not be imposed on these cooperative societies in view of the fact that it is our intention to encourage cooperative societies these cooperative societies might not have the necessary wherewithal or the resources and therefore may not be in a position to contribute to the provident fund on the other hand there is another aspect of the question which it is also necessary to take into consideration in this behalf and it is necessary because this type of protection and many other types of protection are given by way of encouragement to the cooperative societies again there are many uncircumscribed unscrupulous people who form some sort of cooperative society which is a cooperative society only in name and which in fact is merely a proprietary concern and then they take advantage of these particular provisions sir we have realized that there were owners and there were employers who were taking advantage of the fact that the number was kept at 50 it was only when the employees were more than 50 that this particular act was applicable so far they were partitioning their establishment into various departments and into various units and thereby they were trying to escape from the provisions of this act unfortunately the government has now made it clear in this bill that no such partitioning will be useful to the employer because even there if there is partitioning now they will all be considered as one consolidated establishment and if there were more than 20 people employed then this particular law will be applicable to them some such prick is likely to be resorted to by the employer by calling his concern a cooperative society and thereby trying to escape the extension of the benefits that are being provided for the employees in this particular bill now sir there are cooperative societies acts and there are cooperative constitutions where it is made compulsory that after a particular employee has worked for a certain number of years in a given establishment which is a cooperative establishment that employee automatically becomes a member of the cooperative society there is a large number of cooperative constitutions of this type where the right of membership in the cooperative society is guaranteed to the employees who are working for a particular number of years in that particular society i can understand that if this particular bill exempts such societies which permit their own employees to become members of those cooperative societies it would be quite fair because in that case these employees themselves will become members and therefore they will have a dual role of employers being members of the cooperative society and also of employees if however a particular constitution does not provide for such compulsory registration of its employees who have worked for a particular number of years in that concern as members then that kind of relationship is as between as employer and an employee and only in exceptional cases should the government come forward to exempt such cooperative societies from the provisions of this act this kind of blanket exemption which is provided in this particular bill might perhaps be misused though i quite appreciate the anxiety of the government to see that the cooperative societies are allowed as free a scope and development as possible in view of the national policy that the cooperative sector should be encouraged as far as possible therefore i suggest that as far as this provision of exemption 
to the cooperative societies is concerned, this exemption should be given only to those societies which permit their employees to become member of the cooperative societies and as far as other cooperative societies are concerned, it is only on merit that the exemption should be granted and there should not be anything like a blanket exemption whereby merely because it calls itself a cooperative society, merely because of its being a cooperative society, it enjoys the exemption which has been provided therein. Then, sir, there is the question of what is known as the infancy of an industry. Here again, sir, a distinction is made between establishments that employ 50 or more people and the establishments that employ between 20 and 50 people. Now, sir, as far as the establishments that employ 50 or more people are concerned, the infancy period is defined as 3 years while in the case of establishments that employ between say 20 and 50 people, the infancy period is extended up to 5 years. Here again, I do not see any propriety of this particular type of extension. I would like to draw the attention of the Honorable Minister to the fact that there are a large number of industries that are coming up. Sir, I rise to support the demands for grants of the Ministry of Human Resource Development. The Honorable Minister is one of the most intellectual and exp experienced persons in the field of education and is well aware of the need for development of human potential in the areas of education, youth, women and children. The allocation of funds for the various activities of the four departments which constitute his ministry is no doubt in line with their requirements about which I have nothing to say. My only humble request to the Honorable Minister is that he should carry out an appraisal of the working of his ministry to find out if the purpose for which the money has been spent has really been achieved commensurate with the amount spent. To me, it seems that a lot more requires to be done in this respect so that the fruits of quality education reach right down to the poorest of the poor and the socially and economically backward classes. The purpose of good education is to make one really knowledgeable and respectable citizen of this country so that he is able to stand on his own feet and live a decent life. Character building plays an important role in this direction and has to be given its due place in education. It must be understood that good education is the foundation for nation's progress and unless this foundation is made strong and everlasting, no structure constructed on it will stand firm and erect. Therefore, we must endeavor to provide quality education to all sections of the society with particular emphasis on promotion and development of fundamental values like character building, national integrity, secularism, focus on environmental and population education, and so on. It is all the more important that the socially and economically backward classes who form the bulk of our population are drawn into the mainstream of educational activities so that they also contribute their might to the nation's prosperity. Unfortunately, this point seems to have escaped the attention in this year's budget, although there was a mention of it in the last year's budget. The Honorable Minister himself is dedicated to the cause of education and there is hardly anything more that I can tell him. Nevertheless, I feel that our time has come for us to act and if we miss this opportunity, we may repent for a long time to come. Considering the deterioration in the moral standard of the society today, special emphasis has to be laid on character building in our educational system. Children being more amenable to changes, character building should start from them right from the Angal Anganwadi classes up to SSC classes. If children are constantly told about what is good for the country and also what is good for them, 
it will have a great impact on them. The help of Anganwadi workers who do not have work in the evening can be taken to coach children of first and second standards by telling them stories of great people and their work. This could be supplemented by giving them books depicting the lives of great men and their noble deeds for reading at home on which questions can be asked next day during coaching. Once a week, audio-visual presentation can be arranged on the lives and noble deeds of great men. I am sure this will have the desired effect much more faster. With all the money that is spent on education, who are the people who really get the benefits? If we ponder overall aspect, we will find that it is the affluent few and those where both husband and wife are working who are able to reap the benefits because they have all the money with them to get whatever they want. They can send their children to the best schools but costly books and aids arrange special tuitions and send them to special coaching classes to score good marks in competitive exams. Even if these children fail to get admissions to professional courses, their parents can always pay capitation fees and have they them admitted. But what happens to SCST and other economically and socially backward students? They just do not have the right type of atmosphere at home which will motivate them to go to schools and study. Their parents themselves being illiterate and poor would prefer their children to help them in their work and earn money rather than spend time on studies. Under the circumstances, it would be nearly impossible for such students to compete with the city students and get admission to prestigious courses. Therefore, I submit that the need of the day is to set up residential schools for SCST and other socially and economically weaker students on 50-50 basis. These schools should provide free secondary education and also free boarding and lodging facilities. Strict discipline should be maintained in these schools and greater emphasis should be led on character building hard work and dedication, love and respect for the country.